I'd like to begin your conference tonight with the gospel according to St. Luke. And he came out and went as was his custom to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, and knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, remove this chalice from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. The following article appeared in the Catholic newspaper about 20 years ago. The homily in my parish church the other morning was about the nature of Christ, and the associate pastor was doing his best to make Jesus look good, but it seemed it wasn't easy. The short gospel reading from Mark has Christ quoting the psalm. The Lord had said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. The problem priest told the 15 or so mostly older mass goers was that Jesus was mixed up in his use of this particular piece of scripture. In fact, Jesus had misinterpreted the psalm he quoted, an idea that many of them surely were heard for the first time in their lives. But the priest didn't spell out exactly how Jesus had gotten them wrong. When I ran into the priest a few days later, I told him I hadn't understood his sermon about Christ misinterpreting scripture. Well, he did, he said matter-of-factly. But doesn't that raise some problems, I asked. If Christ could be wrong in his teaching, couldn't he be wrong about a lot of other things? The priest shrugged, and standing his hands, arms upward, in the class of who knows gesture, he said, you gotta remember, he said, Jesus did not have the benefit of the same religious education that we have today with all the things that modern scholarship brings us. If the homily itself had been eyebrow raising, the explanation was breathtaking and it's all confidence and condescension toward Jesus as a poor fellow who had been lucky enough to go to the seminary in 1990. If only Jesus were here today, you got the impression that this priest, at least, would be only too happy to straighten him out. <laughs> now, brothers and sisters, I don't want you to think this is an isolated incident. I remember a number of years ago, I was preaching in a large ethnic parish. It was an Italian national parish in a large northeastern American city, something a place like Philadelphia. And I was having lunch with the pastor, and the pastor said to me, you know, today I can't call myself an Alpha Christus, you know, another Christ, that's what we used to call a priest, until I realized that Jesus was a sinner just like all the rest of us. And I preached this to my congregation. Well, I'm from California, I don't start fights in the at the table, but I, um, I, I found this comment funny, and the reason was because I was trying to imagine this priest getting up on Sunday, you know, with all the old Italian ladies dressed in black, <laughs> telling them that Jesus was a sinner, <laughs> and their reaction, because you know, in the Northeast, they don't hide their reactions. A lot he knows, what planet does this stuff live on anyway, like this? In a more exalted sense, though, Cardinal Ratzinger, who is now, as you know, Pope Emeritus Benedict, in 1989 gave an address to assembled Catholic theologians in Europe. You can find that on the internet, and it's called Difficulties Confronting the Faith in Europe Today. In that talk, Cardinal Ratzinger, who was the head of the Hatayim, Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith, 
So the, the Catholic religion today was in deep trouble in three basic areas. The first is what he called in his more academic terminology, the metaphysics of creation. Now what did he mean by that? He meant, and the audience was important as it was composed of, you know, professional teachers of our faith in universities, colleges, and seminaries, and also some bishops. He meant that today there are many teachers of the Catholic religion that say that there's no transcendent God. If you think this is far-fetched, about 20 years ago, my provincial was attending a meeting, now it wasn't all of them, but representing about 80% of the Catholic sisters in the Dominican order in this country. And he said, oh, you would have loved it. At the end of the meeting, they had this procession and they had incense and candles and they walked around the hall and they sang. I said, gee, I didn't think that my sisters were into incense and stuff. Oh, no, it was, oh, it was very beautiful. So after he kind of led me on for five minutes, then he said, and guess what they carried in the procession and incense? And I said, the, the Blessed Sacrament? Oh, no. The image of Christ or the image of Our Lady? No. I said, well, what? He said, the globe. They incensed the world. Mother Earth. The third area in which our religion is in good trouble is the afterlife. If you don't believe in the transcendent God, what do you do with the afterlife? He said he heard a, a preacher in Germany in, in the 70s, maybe, give a homily in which first he denied the existence of hell, then denied the existence of purgatory, and then tried to convince his congregation there was no heaven. And what's described as a future ideal world in the scriptures, he says, well, it is a future ideal world, but it's not outside time. It's when we create here by better social structures. In Italy, they call this the mondo migliore idea. The way I always like to put it is that more indoor plumbing, more education, and that one thing none of us can live without, more meetings <laughs> will solve the problem of human sin. Well, these two areas come together and are crossed in the third area. If you don't believe in an afterlife, if you don't believe in the transcendent God, and you say you're a Christian, what sense do you make of Christ? In his time, when he was giving this talk in 1989, he said there were two tendencies. One was to reduce Jesus to an armed political liberator who led revolutions against unjust social structures. Now, this was very prevalent in Latin America, but not in our country. But one, the other is very prevalent in our country, and that is you reduce Christ to a good man, so good as somehow to be identified with God, who preaches a simple doctrine of love and pacifism, and basically helps us all to be nice. The purpose of religion is for us to be nice. So the way I like to put it is, in the new Christianity, you take the crucifix, and instead of Jesus' dying body up there, you put a California happy face. <laughs> and instead of I and our eye at the back of the cross, you write, nice. Now, he said the biggest problem with this way of looking at our Lord is that it robs him from the principal reason for which he came to heaven to earth. That is to suffer the cross. He says that the new Christianity doesn't emphasize the cross at all. And in the new Christianity, what we actually do is suggest to people that they're not saved by the cross, but saved from the cross. Which, of course, is the problem, for example, with Peter. You remember, Peter said to Jesus when he was made head of the church, and Christ explained that the 
this was going to involve this unpleasant episode called the Passion. God forbid that you should suffer for it. And remember Christ's reaction to this? If I did this to you today, this was in public, and this is the first pope, right? You could probably call the bishop and have him forbidden to preach in this diocese ever again. He walks up to Peter in public and he says, Yet be I be Satan. He calls him Satan. You're trying to make me trip and fall because you're not judging as God judges, but you're judging as man judges. Now, there's, is there anything wrong with judging according to the way man judges? Well, not if you're talking about football or chemistry, but when you're talking about life, death, the problems of human sin, violence, avarice, anger, all these things, there's quite a bit wrong with it. And so to separate the cross from our religion, even though it is a very gruesome symbol, we have the most gruesome symbol of any religion. If you've read it at all, but it's like to die of crucifixion. And you know Mel Gibson had that movie where just the scourging scene was repulsive. It, it's a gruesome symbol. Many people today suggest that the cross was just an unpleasant episode that Jesus suffered, but could have escaped if he wanted to. Well, that's not the way it's portrayed, portrayed in Scripture. He identifies his glorification with the cross, and so as we. So last night, I talked to you in the spiritual life about the first great cross all of us experience, and that is Remember, you enter the castle by addressing your egotism. Now, I think for many people that's a big cross to admit they got an ego to begin with. Secondly, they can be manipulative and can be domineering. And you also try to grow in the virtues of your state. Now, we would like an easy virtue. Adam and Eve had an easy virtue because there was no sin. But we don't. When we first start to act in a virtuous way, even though we're experiencing integrity of heart, it means we demand and, and surrender and give up certain things we're doing, which we might find important and pleasant. There, the, the whole idea that we can do this in some easy fashion is simply ridiculous. And so in the first great way of prayer, once we enter the castle, once the soil is prepared, which is called spiritual infancy, we have to talk about the difference between God's way of looking at things and ours and embracing our first cross. In the mansions of St. Teresa, you see how she has seven mansions, remember, in the interior castle. In the first mansion, though she's writing a book about prayer, she says, oh, there's nothing about she talks about removing sin from your life. Her opinion is that lack of growth in prayer is not a matter of the wrong technique, but of worldliness. It's a lack of virtue. She says the important thing is not to think much, but to love much. Now by this, as you mean we shouldn't think about our religion. Well, you know, a Dominican would have a heart attack over that conclusion. What she's talking about with these very elaborate methods of meditation in Spain at that time, where you'd have to check this box and check this box and check this box and do this and check this box. And, and, and people got so lost in the method and thinking about what they were doing about the method that they forgot it was about a personal union. In other words, they lost the forest through the trees. In the second mansion, when you first begin to grow and experience it, you first begin to experience the conflict between God's way of looking at things and ours, the divine and human. Her advice is to approach this with humility, obedience, love, and patience. You have to embrace your cross and avoid association with mediocre persons. And also, because God knows that we're weak in this regard, you don't lose heart when you fall because God expects us in a certain way to have a certain difficulty with the journey. So, the, 
experience of these virtues is absolutely necessary and basically our first participation in this great change. And you know, I don't know if you're familiar, but the imitation of Christ says, you know, you can never escape the cross because you can never escape yourself. The primary cross each of us has to deal with is in our own souls. When a person becomes used to this in the third nation, they first begin to experience a loving conversation with God, with the Holy Trinity, what we call meditation. Another fancy word for this in spiritual books is discursive prayer, which comes from the word discourse. We begin to allow God to teach us about what it means to see the world from the supernatural point of view. And meditation is difficult to describe. People ask you about how you do meditation. Well, basically what you do is you think about something God has done for you. And it can be something from nature. It can be something from the sacraments. It can be his life, the lives of the saints, anything that helps to show you the divine love of God for you personally. God has a personal providence for each and every one of you. And he had that providence before the world began. And then when a person realizes their love in a disinterested way, they can't help but return that love. And so they experience a bond of love, of thanksgiving, and again, of humility. Now, this is the preparation ground for what actually experience happens in the depths of the spiritual life. Prayer. Remember, all of you are called to this as all of you are baptized. This is contained by seed in the sanctifying grace you receive. A very peculiar thing happens. God takes over the process. He takes you at your word. And whatever honeymoon you have experienced in a religious, in a religious practice, let's say you come to church and always got warm fuzzies and things like that, all of a sudden, they end in prayer. And you experience dryness. You experience a lack of God. You enter what's called the fourth mansion, or I always like to call it spiritual teenagerhood. Now, why do I call it spiritual teenagerhood? Well, I've been dealt with teenagers recently, but you know, I taught them at Catholic boys' school and dealt with them in spades. Teenagers, as you know, are kind of a mess. And the reason is because they're not children anymore. So physical rewards and punishments basically mean almost nothing to them. On the other hand, they're not adults either. You know, they try to convince you that you can give them all the responsibility for their life. And as soon as they do that, you allow them some grounds for personal responsibility. Sometimes they carry it out, but a lot of times they don't. So they are between childhood and adulthood, but they're neither one nor the other, they have no identity, and they suffer. Well, a similar thing is true in this. Whatever the delights of earth are, we know are false. But we haven't even learned to appreciate the lights of heaven and the delights of God, and we don't understand them. And so we experience what John of the Cross calls two dark nights. Now, superficially sometimes, people talk about the dark nights of the soul as though they're emotional problems, you know, like neuroses. And I'm not saying you can't be very holy by the way you approach neuroses, but that's not what's meant by the dark nights of the soul in the spiritual life. God infuses prayer into us, which is divinely given according to his way of thinking. Some people think that we should sit there to produce the dark nights and blank out our brain by our will. St. Teresa says at one point there were people in Spain called the Alumbrados, the illumined ones, who tried to blank out their brain. They said, you shouldn't think about Jesus and Mary when you're praying. And in her practical common sense, she says, people who talk this way, words fail me about how stupid it is. She says, God gave us a brain to think with. If he wants to give us a higher way of thinking, he'll do that, but we can't produce this. 
we wait upon him for this because he's running the process now. And you know, that's a problem on part of this cross for human beings because one thing we hate to give up is running the process. And we don't run this at all. A pleasing image of this is seen, some of you may have seen this series made in Spain by the church. Angelica put on about 20 years ago about the life of St. Teresa of Avila. And so she's sitting there cooking dinner, right? And she feels this infused prayer coming on her. And she says, not now, Lord. The soup will burn. <laughs> In any case, what's happening to us is that God elevates us to his way of understanding, his way of loving, but because we don't understand it, we experience it like a martyrdom because we're so unused to the way God does things. Though this great way, which is also called the fancy spiritual voice, the illuminative way, involves initial reflection on God, a gentle infused awareness, I emphasize again, not produced by human effort of being alone with the alone. And though it's often called the prayer of quiet or delight in God, this is very different than human delights. What we have to do is learn how to receive from him. And learning how to receive from him is something, again, we as human beings find very difficult to do. Because first of all, what we're receiving is so mind-blowing that in the dark night of the senses, we experience no emotional consolations in religion anymore. The honeymoon is over. And just as in marriage, once the honeymoon ends, and I know lots of people would like to extend it throughout all their lives, but you know that's very unrealistic because for one thing, it's a necessary part of growth, but it's very superficial you have to learn to lose your ego to someone else and make to you, because over the two become as one in the marriage. Well, a similar thing is true with God. The soul says to itself, was there ever a soul as dry as mine? Every time I come into the church, I feel nothing. I feel nobody's listening. And yet, we're to persevere in this. And if a person does persevere in this, they experience what the worst of the dark nights, the greatest cross. John of the Cross found this so difficult he couldn't even describe it, which is called the dark night of the spirit. In the dark night of the spirit, God is pulling up our ego by the root, weeds by the roots and pulling them out. And we begin to realize that we cannot capture God or the prison in our little lazy thinking. People say to me, I say these prayers and they're never answered. That's because you've decided the answer. God gives the answer his way in his time. The Catechism of the Catholic Church states, the primary answer to all prayer is the transformation of the praying heart. In other words, the fact that you realize that you depend upon him don't understand for all the things that you have and are. I always like to compare this, a good method of comparison, is learning another language and living in another culture, in this case the culture of heaven, the language of heaven, the language of faith. I don't know if uh, the United States is a culture that you were not raised in, but how do you get used to another culture? You know, I spent six years in Italy. I was sent there to Rome, and one of the jobs I was given was in charge of the money for a large, the largest community in our order, 120 friars. Believe me, I did my purgatory for the rest of my life in that job. And when I first went there, I barely spoke Italian, and I had to do business with Italian businessmen. And you know, though they may speak English, they won't tell you that. I mean, their opinion is, you're in my country, you speak my language. So, how do you learn another language? Well, you know, you basically have to sit there for months and not understand much. You're in isolation, because the, you can't communicate with anybody really exactly, and you have to be patient. And not only that, but you have to be humble enough 
to try and make stupid mistakes. I'll give you an example of one of my stupid mistakes. There was a priest in this community, you know, we all have him, who had had some trouble with moral life. He was from Sicily. And so they moved into Rome. Well, needless to say, he was quite a liberal Catholic, and I'm not. And so we used to argue, and I, tr I tried to argue with him in Italian. So one day I wanted to say to him, in this opinion, you were the same as Martin Luther. So I said to him, two, say, you are Lutero. He says, Lutero, io, me. I said, si, Lutero. Well, of course, he starts to laugh at the Lord. He's like, well, that's a very odd reaction to what I just said. So for the next week, if we'd be out walking in the cloister and he'd be moving with Italians, he'd scream over me, he's done OEO, who am I? And I'd go, Lutero. Everybody would laugh at Roris. So finally, someone took pity on me. And they said, Lutero in Italian is L apostrophe U T E R O. And it means the uterus. <laughs> Martin Luther's name is Lutero with an accent over the E to distinguish it. I mean, who knew, right? And you know, if you're patient and you sit there long enough and you try, eventually you learn how to, you know, uh, communicate with people. Now, these people before could have been looking at me and saying, you're the most wonderful person on earth, I love you, I want to have a personal relationship with you. That was the main way to communicate. But what I was receiving was because I hadn't learned to speak the language yet. And you know, they say to speak Italian well, you have to have three dictionaries, right? You have words, then you have gestures. This means I talk on the phone. This means somebody's crazy. This means you like the food. And this is, depends on the context. <laughs> And then you have what they call the Dictionary of Inarticulate Groans, which is, oh, 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 like this. They say the further down the boot you go, the less words you have to carry on a conversation. So I asked the priest who was in Italy once, I said, is it true that you can have a whole conversation in southern Italy and not say a word? And he went, ah! <laughs> which is, of course, because I spoke the language. By then, I knew meant yes. Now see, this is what happens to us with God. God is communicating in faith the way he communicates his attitude toward the world. And we experience it as a darkness, not because he's not communicating well with us, but because we haven't learned to receive yet, to understand yet. And think about this now. This way is called in books the illuminative way, and yet it's characterized by two dark nights. Doesn't that seem contradictory to you? How can something be dark and be night and then light at the same time? Well, if you went out and looked into the sun today, eventually you would experience darkness. Is that because there's an absence of light or an absence of communication on the part of the sun? No, it's because your eye is too weak to take it all in. And eventually, because you're dealing with material energy and material light, it will destroy your eye. But remember, our spirits are infinite potentially. So they won't be destroyed, but they'll be expanded. But it'll be very mysterious how all of this happens. Interestingly enough, when the fathers of the church used to describe this experience, they used the pagan philosophy. Aristotle once said, before the deepest things of the world, the mind of man is like the eye of the bat or the owl looking into the sun. Now bats and owls have a, have a darkness usually. Their eyes are often weak and when they fly into the light they're blinded. But that's not because there's not no light to see. It's because they haven't learned to appreciate the light which they have been given. This is a common experience for people growing in our prayer life and our faith. And it's interesting that even great saints experience it. I don't know if you're familiar with the 
controversy that occurred a few years ago, but Mother Teresa of Calcutta's Journal of the Soul was published. And this nun, you know, who was famous for her humor, her smile, famous for, uh, you know, thousands of sisters all around the world selflessly serving the poor, says this in her diary. I feel arrogance, darkness, solitude, torture. I sense silence and a deep void within. I suffer because I look for Christ without finding him, because I listen without hearing. My smile is a mask and a mantle that covers everything. Now, when fake news read that, they said, see, fake does nothing for you. See, it's all useless. No, that's the classic description of the dark night of the soul. And you know, people that experience this, they're not going around pouting all the time. Our religion is a joyous religion. You would never know a person who's experiencing this, who is experiencing it. But in their souls, and the only place they experience this is when they come to pray. They say, again, was there ever a desert like mine? And the psalmist says, we brave and wait for the Lord. But what are we waiting for? Are we waiting for God to become present with him? Well, if you're in the state of mortal sin, yes, you would be waiting for that because you don't have grace. But if you're pretty certain you're not in the state of mortal sin, then God is present in your soul. What you're waiting for is to be able to appreciate the way he communicates himself to us. And you can see this in the contrary attitudes of our Lord and the Passion we read about at the beginning, where it's possible that this cup pass me by, because at least on two levels of his soul, his emotions and his desire to survive as a human being, the Passion repulsed him. But because he was a perfect human being, on the higher level of his soul where he chose in morals to do the will of God, it didn't detract or that make him vacillate from why he was doing it. And that's why he says, but not as I will, but as you will. And you know, there's one tradition in the church, Thomas Aquinas says, that Christ, the man, couldn't say this if he wasn't aware of the resurrection of the dead. In other words, he didn't know about the resurrection of the dead. But he freely embraced this because he knew it was the only way to save us. Remember, Jesus gets nothing from his suffering and death, but he gives all to us. Now, some people ask, why does God allow us to experience this? Wouldn't it be just great to have a warm, fuzzy religion? Why on earth do we have to experience this suffering? Well, Many people think it's that God doesn't love them. That's not true. God allows us to experience this because he wants to make our hearts like his. Because in his personal problems for you, whether it's your family, your friends, your job, your sufferings, your old age, whatever, in his personal problems for you, he wants you to be a participant in the salvation of the human race with him. Now, when you enter this way, you're not looking up at the cross, but you're looking down on the cross with Christ, and you're adopting his attitude toward the world. It's a grace, we can't do it ourselves, but he wants to do it for us, we just have to be open. And yet, it can be the most intense suffering a person experiences internally. What I've been trying to say in this conference about this suffering is very well explained in the little Chinese legend I ran across. Once upon a time, in the heart of the Western Kingdom, lay a beautiful garden. And there, in the cool of the day, was the master of the garden, accustomed to walk. Of all the inhabitants of the garden, the most beautiful and most beloved was the gracious and noble bamboo tree. Year after year, bamboo grew yet more noble and gracious, conscious of his master's love and watchful delight, but modest and gentle nonetheless. 
and often when wind came to revel in the garden, Bamboo would cast aside his grave stateliness to dance and play right merrily, tossing and swaying and leaping and bowing, in joyous abandon, leading the great dance of the garden, which most delighted the master's heart. Now one day, the master himself drew near to contemplate his bamboo, the vice of curious expectancy, and bamboo, in a passionate adoration, bowed his great head to the ground in loving freedom. The master spoke. Bamboo, bamboo, I would use you. Bamboo flung his head to the sky in utter delight. The day of days had come, the day for which he had been made, the day to which he had been growing hour by hour, the day in which he would find his completion and his destiny. His voice came low, Master, I am ready. Use me as you will. Bamboo, the master's voice was great. I would take you and cut you down. A trembling and great horror shook Bamboo. Cut me down? Me who knew master had made the most beautiful in all your garden? Cut me down. Not that, not that. Use me for your joy, O master, but cut me not down. For love of Bamboo, the moist master's voice was greater still. If I cut you not down, I cannot use you. The garden grew still when it held his breath. Bamboo slowly bent his proud and glorious head. There came a whisper. Master, if you can't use me, would you cut me down? Then do your will, cut. Hmm. Bamboo, beloved bamboo, I would cut your leaves and branches from you also. Master, master, spare me, cut me down with my beauty in the dust. But would you take from me my leaves and branches also? Bamboo, alas, if I cut them out of way, I cannot use you. The sun hid his face, a listening butterfly glided fearfully away, and Bamboo shivered in terrible expectancy, whispering low, Master, cut away. Bamboo, bamboo, I would yet cut you in half and cut out your heart. For if I cut not so, I cannot use you. Then was Bamboo bowed to the ground. Master, Master, cut and free. So did the master of the garden take Bamboo and cut him down, and hack off his branches and strip off his leaves, and cut him in half and cut out his heart. And lifting him gently carried him to where was a spring of fresh, sparkling water in the midst of his dry fields. Then, putting one end of broken bamboo in the spring and the other end in the irrigation water channel in the field, the master laid down gently his beloved bamboo. And the spring sang welcome from clear, sparkling waters, raced joyously down the channel of bamboo's torn body into the waiting field. Then the rice was planted, and the days went by, and the shoots grew, and the harvests came. In that day was bamboo, once so glorious in his state of beauty, yet more glorious in his brokenness and humility. For in his beauty he was life abundant, but in his brokenness he became a channel of abundant life to his master's world. Many of us suffer great things in life and we wonder why. It's because the world is thirsting for grace. Christ experienced the passion. Christ experienced the crucifixion. The cross is the symbol of our religion and we cannot escape it if we are to be his followers. And you know, for the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, we read a passage of St. Paul, where he says that God has chosen us before the world began, which is, of course, applied in this case to Mary's choice to be the mother of our Lord. But God chose you before the world began, too. And he chose you also to be on your own level, in your own place, 
to be a part of the mystery of that redemption. So when you are cut spiritually by the experience of spiritual darkness, this is so when you surrender to him that you will experience his way of knowing and his way of loving and thus participate also in the means of redemption, not only to yourself, but also to all those you know, serve and love. In fact, on a certain level, the whole human race. A very Catholic way of putting this is to reflect the fact that what Jesus wants to do is to replace your human heart with his sacred heart. Sacred heart of Jesus, overflowing with love for mankind, pierced and wounded for love of me. The source of the source of the sacraments from your wounded heart as you died on the cross. Make our hearts like 